Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Paganini 5 Challenge. Today is day four. I hope you've been enjoying day one, day two, and day three of the challenge. I would love to know how you're doing with all those, uh, all the stuff that we've been covering in the first three days. Let me know how, how your progress is going. Are you making 5% progress every day? I hope so. If you're just joining me for the Paganini 5 Challenge, welcome. My name is Lynn Kuo, and I'm the Assistant Concert Master of the National Ballet of Canada Orchestra and the founder of Violin with Dr. Lynn. Okay, so today is about taking the left-hand technique a little further, and especially for you violinists and violists who have smaller hands, like me. Okay, so what does MVP stand for for those of us who have forgotten what MVP stands for. MVP stands for minimum viable pressure. This term comes from Nathan Cole, okay? It's not, it does not come from me. Let's credit, let's give credit to those who deserve the credit. Nathan Cole has coined MVP and I think it has caught on fire around the world. We talked about how uh, yesterday in Building Speed, how we consciously think about what kind of finger pressure we are using or not using to help give us a little bit more fluency because when we use too much speed, it will slow us down. So I like to think of the minimum pressure needed to, to build speed. Even though my left hand fingernails are very short, sometimes they get in the way when playing. Do I need to be more on the pads and less on the tips? Great question. If you are getting too much nail, that does seem to me that you might be too much on the tip so yeah, experiment with a bit more flesh and see if that helps. So am I the only one who wishes she had a small hand? I noticed small hands have natural finger curves. My long fingers sometimes collapse and lock. Hmm. Yeah, I think we all have hand envy. The, those of us who have short, Small hands want bigger hands, and those of us, I guess, who have longer fingers want shorter fingers. You know, it's always the grass is greener on the other side. Your fingers sometimes collapse, and some, yeah, I mean, some people have very, very flexible or hyper flexible joints. So perhaps that can be looked at with your private teacher in terms of developing a stronger arch. So I'm using a fourth finger as an example. So if they're collapsing, like that's a collapse, if you can tell the distal joint here right? It's collapsing. You may need to do some kind of strengthening exercises. And if you want to go visit my YouTube tutorial, and I have a tutorial on how to strengthen your pinky. I'm not sure if you're talking specifically about your pinky. We will talk more about the pinky today. But that is one thing that you could do is to do what I call cleaning the palm. And that will encourage a bit of strength to develop some strength and then you will develop more of a curve. Okay. All right. First left hand secret that we're going to talk about today is especially if you have small hands, for those of you who have nice, gorgeous, long fingers, if one, two, four fingering, it's probably not going to be such a big deal for you. However, if you're like me, it kind of is a big deal. Doing this one, two, four is a big deal, especially if I want to go fast. The faster I go, I feel like my fingers will start to compress and then it goes, it goes out of tune. So what I try to do, this is left hand secret number one. Okay, for a small hand, this C to from the second finger to a four is a major third, right? So this to me feels like a stretch. Okay, for a small hand, it feels like a stretch. How do we mitigate this stretchy, uncomfortable strain? Well, one left hand basic is in Whenever you have a stretch, not so much in Paganini 5, but in, in general, whenever you have a stretch, especially involving the fourth finger, try to start by placing your fourth finger first and then stretching your hand back. That's a general principle. So that's one left hand secret now. So I put the fourth finger down first, and then this one's easier to reach, a C, a two. And then, then it's much easier to reach for the one. You can almost start this caprice, uh, this agitato section in second position if you are doing this one, two, four fingering. Okay, so that's one tip. Start with the four and then stretch backwards. It will be much more 
comfortable and less straining than starting with a one and stretching up to the four. You can even try and compare the difference. Try one, stretching up to a four, and see how that feels in your left hand, and then try the opposite. Start with a four, and then two, and then move back. You will feel that it's much, much more easy, okay? This is probably very common sense to many of you, but for some of you who have not heard it, and this is your first time, this is a foundational left-hand secret, okay? Start with the pinky and stretch back, all right? That's number one. Now. This one, however, in Pagnini Dupree's number five, it often starts on this one. So what are we going to do? We don't always have the luxury of starting with a four and switching back, right? So this is where we return back to what we learned about in day two on arpeggios, scales, and shifting. The role of the ulna bone. Okay, the ulna bone, the arm bone here on the ulna side, which is the pinky side. This is the bone that opens and closes from this elbow, okay? So this is where I start to use the ulna to, remember how we said the ulna carries the hand? So if let's say I'm putting my second finger on this on the two, that means my ulna and my hand sitting on top of my ulna is actually parked, like you're parking a car. I've parked my car in second position, okay? Now this should be much easier to, to, to place the fourth on the E, okay? So what happens is if, if I had to start on the one, on the A, which is in first position, okay? What do I do to stretch to two? Now we're starting to strain, aren't we? If you have a small hand like mine, you're gonna start to strain to reach the two in second position. Now it's from here I ask, instead of stretching the four, which looks uncomfortable here, what I'm gonna do is ask the owner for help. I'm asking the owner, I'm gonna go towards my face. Just deliver, and I'll show you what my thumb is doing. This is the one, this is the two. Now I'm gonna to want to reach the four, which is really hard to reach, isn't it? Right, technically it's hard to reach. Now I'm gonna ask the ulna to come towards my face. My thumb is dragged a little bit, but just see, do you see how my thumb just moved just a little bit? Now I'm more comfortable. So there is a little bit of let's say flexibility in the thumb. So my thumb just creeped up a little bit. Did you all see that, I hope? Just this much, this much right here, just this much. Uh, can I play here? Okay, so that's a bit of a crawling method, okay? Now, just remember that the crawling doesn't just happen in fingers, it is carried by the ulna bone, okay? So that's your second left-hand secret today. So if you need to stretch up, use the crawling motion, okay, that is supported from the ulna bone, okay? Now, your third left-hand tip, thumb, okay? The thumb is really important. If you have a stretch, again, this is all about left-hand secrets for people with small hands, okay? So this first thing is a stretch. It really helps whenever you're straining or trying to avoid straining to think about your thumb, okay? So you can see here that I'm wiggling my thumb. That's just for me to remind myself not to squeeze my thumb, okay? You want to take away some of that tension and keep the thumb as relaxed as possible. When you have a relaxed thumb, then the rest of the hand, okay? The rest of the hand can relax as well. So, do you see how my thumb is actually free to move? Okay, I can't really move this chair away. Okay, so I hope that makes uh, sense. We have the positioning of the forefinger first stretching back. If that's not possible, then if you're going to stretch from the one to the four, then you're going to ask your ulna to carry your hand frame up, just sneaking a little bit. You're crawling a little bit. While you're crawling, you're keeping your thumb loose because the once the thumb loosens, the rest of the hand will loosen as well. All of this helps you expand your hand. Even if you have a large hand, you can make it even larger, right? Um, Okay, so thumb is mobile. So that's your fourth tip, your fourth left-hand secret. Your thumb can be mobile. It can move around. No longer are we going to say that a thumb is locked in position next to or across from the first finger. If you need to move it up, if you need to move it down, allow your hand to find its comfortable position, okay? Now, your fourth tip is that the hand can actually expand this way, okay? The hand can actually... Like, like as if there's a rubber band wrapped around here. Let's pretend this is a rubber band. Okay, so as if, uh, 
as if you're expanding and then it tightens back again, expanding and tightens back again. So you can actually try that with your, your hand. You can just see how elastic your hand can be. All right, you can actually play with that. So you don't ever have to strain the hand because the rubber, rubber band will take you back. Okay, that's all it feels like, rubber band. Okay, now, that was probably a tip number five, wasn't it? The next thing about the thumb, we talked about loosening the thumb. You know what actually helps loosen the thumb? Is knowing how long the thumb actually is. If you would like to join me, let's take a look at your left hand. Okay, we're going to start palpating with your right hand. Okay, so we usually think of the bottom joint as this one here, don't we? That's not the bottom of the thumb. Really? It's not. Let's look at the palm. Okay, from the top. Okay, this is the dis the first knuckle here. Any knuckle here would be called the distal joint. Okay, and we have another joint. Okay, here, but there's also in the thumb, all the way down here, right by your wrist. So if you actually take your pinching fingers, your thumb and your uh, index finger, okay, you're going to go from the top of your thumb, from the nail, down, 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 down. Now you keep going. You feel the, the bone on either side. Okay, my bone keeps going, keeps going. You see that? So if I took a pen... Okay, you can join me if you want. I had to do this exercise with Jennifer Johnson. Okay, I'm starting to start marking here. All the way, look, my pen's actually digging right into the side of my bone, right there. Okay, and then we're gonna do the other side. Left hand secret number six, the bone of your thumb is all the way down. Okay, so once I've drawn that, I can actually take a look. Wow, my thumb is beautifully long. And you know what? This is not just a left hand secret. This is also a right hand secret. This can actually transform your spiccato. Once you know and feel how long your right thumb is. Oh, and guess what we're gonna be doing tomorrow? Off the string strokes. Pretty cool, right? So all of this flows into one another, all the concepts. Now I'm gonna do, um, put a little plug in for a student of mine in my bootcamp, Lauren Smee, if you're watching, I hope you're here. Lauren Smee is actually teaching a body mapping workshop. This information that I'm talking about, these left-hand secrets actually comes from the concepts we learn in body mapping. And if you're not familiar with body mapping, body mapping helps us gain more freedom in our movement and understanding of our body so that we can gain freedom in our movement, get better posture with holding our instrument, know where we're holding tension in our bow hold, in our shoulders, our neck, our, our pelvis, are everywhere and anywhere, everywhere and anywhere in the body. I hope that's really helpful because I've learned quite a lot about the violin and by how to play the violin better just by studying body mapping. If you move your arm, isn't that almost a mini shift? That's an excellent question. Yeah, I, I actually try to grapple my head around this, but aren't I cheating? Aren't I actually shifting? Yes, you're right. Uh, when I first learned this concept about sneaking the ona bone up, yeah, it is kind of a shift, isn't it? Now. But for a small hand, if I want to reach that four, it's better to execute a half shift, okay? I'm actually carrying the hand towards my face, right? It is a little bit of a shift, isn't it? I started in one, first position, and then I sneak into two. So yes, it is a sort of a crawling shift, isn't it? It's part, part extension, part shift. In fact, it's, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to aid the extension. If I had a large hand, like some of you lovely folk, I would just do da 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 in one position. It would be no problem for you. But because I don't want to strain, okay, this muscle is going to get very strained, this one right here. Okay, I don't want that necessarily to happen. Then I'm going to use a bit of uh, what I know about the the, the, mo the range of motion of this arm bone and a sense of soft hand, okay, soft thumb, and a lot of, I would say, mm, flexibility in where you are. The thing is, a, a pure shift, so sister right here, a pure shift would probably look like, I'm going to hit the wall with my bow here. That's a pure shift. I go to a, from first position to a second position. That's my guide note. And I drop the two. That's a pure shift, isn't it? So that's a bit too messy for me. I would rather do an extend shift. There you go. You see how?
how you watch my uh, on the bone. See how it's creeping? It's creeping up. I think it's a good thing. Okay, speaking about the thumb, where do you place it on the top note of Paganini 5's arpeggio? How do you move it back? This is a good question. I think it's going to depend on your morphology, the size of your hand. I have a small hand and I need to... You see, my, I'm pretty much in what cellists call thumb position, okay? But I know that some bigger hands can have their thumb right around the neck here and still reach this. I can't play the scale if my thumb is there. I need to get out here, my thumb out here in, in a thumb position. I think it's going to depend on your hand, okay? Throughout the song or throughout the piece, can you change certain fingerings? Absolutely, why not? You need to change your fingerings to what suits you, okay? Find out what works best for your hand. I know my hand is small, so I work with fingerings that work for me. Okay, so that was basically a six, six quick left hand secrets, for, especially for small hands. Now, shall we touch on one last one before we go? A little bonus. How do we vibrate on the fourth finger if you have small hands? Would you like to know that? This is what I actually have come up with. Now, I take the, my inspiration from my fourth finger strategy from, from none other than great soloist Nicola Benedetti. I saw this on her wonderful tutorial series. Um, she had a long one on two of them on vibrato. And she does this amazing fourth finger vibrato that she says she executes by locking her finger. Can you believe it? We talk about fourth finger vibrato when it should be, let's say, in, fourth, in first position, that there needs to be a curve, right? We want a beautiful arch and we want the distal joint to have a give in it. The more give we have in the distal joint, the more amplitude we can get on a vibrato. What do I mean by amplitude? Just walking. If you need a refresher, I've got two vibrato videos on my website. They're on YouTube and on my website. You can go check them out and talk all about that. So typically we want that distal joint to curl, right? But when I'm up here, I have a lot of trouble getting the same amplitude. It just for me won't work. I look a little stiff. So my solution, I can't sustain this note too, too long. I lock everything. Don't tell anyone I said that. Okay, I already, I already told everyone I said that. I, I'm locking everything. Distal joint and this, what's this joint? I forget what that's called. And this joint, it's all kind of locked. Now, how am I gonna get a vibrato if everything's locked in all three of these finger joints, right? And even down here. So I try to remember that the finger goes all the way down to the wrist, just like the thumb did, just like I marked my thumb. I think he's gonna go all the way down. So that seems to help a little. Now, what I'm gonna do is, remember what, how we talked about finger pressure. What I do is I subtract a bit of finger pressure. So it's not a five, maybe four or three. And now on top of that string, I'm riding on top of the string, then a wiggle. So there's a wiggle happening. Now let's take a look at the body here. This wrist joint is capable of flexion, okay? Flex, extend, flex, extend. So that's a part of my fourth finger vibrato formula up high. I do a little bit of this while this is locked. Okay, that's how I get my wiggle. That's how I get my vibrato wiggle. Now, if I want a little bit more, sometimes I'll ask the end of the ulna bone here. This is also capable of opening as well. So there's a combination actually in my, I don't know, my, my proprietary fourth finger vibrato, which I take inspiration from Nicola Benedetti. There's a bit of ulna opening and closing. Okay. This is flexing, this is extending. This is also flexing and extending, okay? But this is kind of my tool, a tool that sits on top of the note and I wiggled from the bigger part portions of my arm. So. Same thing here. As you can see, it's kind of locked like that. And I don't have to hold it for very long. So hopefully no one notices that it's locked and hopefully it doesn't sound too offensive. But I, like I said, I got that from the great soloist Nicola Benedetti. And for me, it's working right now. <gasps> Yay! Do you do different vibrato exercises in high positions than you do in lower positions? That's a great question. Or the same exercise, just using different muscles when you are in 65th position on the E string? Wow, that's a fantastic question. How do we practice vibrato up there? Yeah, when I practice my scales up high, hmm. Let's see, what I'm thinking about, what's different about up here in the 65th position 
I think is finger pressure for sure. Up here, down in lower positions, we have a pretty solid finger pressure where the string is fully depressed down to the fingerboard. When we get past third, fourth, five, six, even in six or seven positions, my finger pressure starts to sit around three because the fingers, thing, the string is not really fully all the way. And then there's also, if you have seen my vibrato tutorial, I also talk about a vertical component. So it's kind of sitting halfway into the string and there's a bit of verticality going up and down, kind of like if you were on a tight rope, okay, you're sitting in the middle of the tight rope and the tight rope goes ooh, 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 just a little bit, right? You need to have a little bit of horizontal to get the oscillation of your pitch, right? Da, but there's also a little bit of, of verticality as well. So how would I practice vibrato up here? Well, I'm definitely at this on this finger. I'm thinking of the the wobbling, the weeble wobble. Mm -hmm. I do not have a good weeble wobble demonstration. But if this was round, right, it would weeble wobble like this. And that's how I think of my finger up there. So. so locked. But now, this is not so much of a weeble wobble, is it? This is more of a hello, hello, goodbye, goodbye, hello, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> that's what I'm doing up there. So similar here, I'm engaging a little bit of this. Oh, you can't really see, can you? This is opening up, up a little bit, and this a little bit is getting as well. So here, I think I'm, what I'm doing is I'm doing a little bit of this. Okay? So let me know how that works. It's going to be a bit of trial and error for you, as I know it was for me, and I'm still always continually working on things. It might change next year. You might see me next year and my vibrato might have changed. You use full finger pressure during vibrato in lower positions. In... Hmm. If there's probably not enough finger pressure, you can tell the sound quality has suffered. So it has to be enough so that the sound quality is solid. You know what? You could actually start with a five finger pressure but then you can imagine that the fingerboard is made of boingy rubber. And then as soon as you hit a five in your finger pressure, it bounces you out and just gives you enough, maybe four. So you maybe place it at a five and then it seems to bounce up to a four. That will prevent you from holding a five pressure down. Does that make sense? So you can experiment that with that. So you can think, what is my finger pressure? In my left hand, what kind of finger pressure am I doing right now? And when I get stressed, I, I start to go into a five or six. Yeah, so I have to think about finger pressure a lot. I also lock my pinky for vibrating in first position. It's okay. Um, you know what? I have to say on in honesty, yes, I, I actually do it. If I, I've studied my own practice videos, and I have definitely seen myself do that as well. Yeah, because you know why? Here's maybe, we'll add another left hand secret for small hands. Sometimes with my fourth finger, okay? Sometimes with my fourth finger, if I want a vibrato, I have to use much more flesh, okay? So sometimes, yes, in first position, I will resort to a, a flat fourth, flattened fourth finger too, because I want more flesh. Here, I'll, I'll, you can tell me the difference of what this sounds like. This is a fully curved finger, more on the tip. Now I'm going to flatten it and get more flesh. Tip. Oh, can't get it now. Flesh, flattened. Personally, I feel like I get more uh, uh, amplitude on my brow when I get a flatter finger. And that's because I'm doing the hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye from this flexion and extension. The flatter finger sounds better. That's why I, I had such a dilemma because I know theoretically that we ought to have these beautiful arched fingers, right? We, that's the textbook way of vibrating. But honestly, I've, I've listened to my playing and I get a more, I get a wider oscillation on my vibrato with a flattened out pinky. Okay.
there are a bunch of us that actually do this. And I've seen this. I think I have a colleague in the Toronto Symphony. I've seen her. She plays beautifully and she does exactly the same. So you know what? I'm going to hereby give all of us permission to experiment with that fourth finger, okay, with a, with a flattened fourth finger. I'm not going to say locked fourth finger. I would rather say flattened and more fleshy fourth finger. Experiment. I think short-fingered violinists need to play like violas. Yeah, you know what? That is a nice philosophy. If we consider our uh, uh, us as small-handed people as if we're playing the viola, I think we'll be fine. Give it a shot. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, okay? Everyone's built extremely differently, right? I like to think that we all wear a different cut of jeans, right? Isn't that true? There's a bajillion pairs of jeans out there and they all fit us differently. We need to find the one pair of jeans that fits us really well. On arpeggios, what do you think of flesh digitizing with E without stepping on zero? Why do you prefer to use all your fingers while stepping? Oh, I think you are referring on arpeggios. Oh, I think, are you thinking about, is that what you're thinking about? Digitizing with B without stepping on. Oh, harmonic? Like that? I think that's what you mean. I think that's absolutely fine. In fact, because it's a technique of going light with your finger pressure, it's a technique for building speed, isn't it? So that's really a great question. You can absolutely use the harmonic fingering and that helps you build up speed. I will see you tomorrow because tomorrow's gonna be a culmination of everything that we've done with uh, hand frame. DSOs, GOs, ulna, finger pressure, building speed. We're going to take it into the right side, okay? What we're going to do is go to the right side of the body and get into off the string strokes. Sautier, spiccato, and ricochet. Are you excited? Are you excited for that day? Tomorrow's the day you've been waiting for, right? So I hope you're excited for tomorrow. I'm excited for tomorrow. Thanks for hanging out with me. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.